This is not the story you expected. It's not the story of Ruth. It's a story that, as many of you have heard, starts in a garden. It ends in a garden with a cross somewhere in between. It's a story that we find ourselves dwelling within somewhere between Act 4 and the climactic Act 5 that is yet to come. It is not the story you expected. It is not the story of Ruth. It's a story that is often seen as somewhat insignificant and easily skipped with none of the eternal consequences of all the other stories in the grand narrative we know. And yet, as we look more closely at it, we may just find that it is a story about a God who provides for his people, who cares for his people, who redeems his people, even us today. This story takes place after, at a time that the Israelites called the time of the judges. This time, the time of the judges, is a time after God had led his people and redeemed them from Egypt out of slavery and led them quite literally through the wilderness as a pillar of fire and smoke. This story takes place after God had once again parted the river, a river, this time the river Jordan, and led his people safely through on dry land. The story takes place after they had entered the land flowing with milk and honey, after he had commanded those people to to capture 12 stones and to put them up so that in generations to come, one kids might say, why is that stone there? The dad might say, so that you would remember, so that you would know that you were slaves in Egypt and your God redeemed you. He provided for you and he gave you this land here flowing with milk and honey. This is the time of the judges. It is before the time of kings, before the time of heroic names like Solomon and David and even Saul. This is the time of the judges. It is a time with different heroic names, names you heard in your Sunday school classes when you were wee high, names like Gideon and Deborah and Samson. It's the time of the judges, a time with villains whose names also ring in your ears, groups of people with names like Philistines and Canaanites and Moabites. This is the time of judges. It was a time of wars and rumors of wars. It was a time where Israel conquered and sometimes was conquered. It was a time when Israelites saw that their favor with their God, living in a land flowing with milk and honey, but it was also a time when Israelites, the Israel leaders, would sometimes lead them astray, lead them to worship false gods, false idols, at which times God would turn his back towards them until the people would cry out, redeem us, redeem us, O God. And with works of his mighty hand, he would swoop in and protect his people and bring them home to him. Miraculous things would happen during this time, sometimes small things, Sometimes it was a a fleece being dry one day and being wet the next day. Sometimes much bigger things. Sometimes it was hair being long and a person being strong. Sometimes it was false temples being ripped to the ground, and sometimes it was legions of angel armies. This was the time of judges. And this is not what this story is about either. It takes place during the time of Judges, but it's not about those times, those stories of renown. No, it's about the things that happen in between those stories of renown. It's about the average everyday life of Israelites. It's about the average person who's just trying to faithfully live out their life in light of the Torah. It's about the people like you and me just going along with their lives trying to faithfully live 
for their God and find their next meal. It's about the people whose names get lost to the annals of history and at first glance do not seem very important. It's about trying to make ends meet. When God does not necessarily show up in some miraculous way, His mighty hand, but instead works through His people to provide daily bread. And indeed, God had created a system so that when they lived in this land flowing with milk and honey, their daily needs, their daily bread would be met. He'd actually written it into law to ensure that people would never go hungry and never be without. He had codified it so that if you were someone who had, who had a lot, who had wealth, who had land, who had a farm, you were commanded not to farm the entirety of your farmstead. As a matter of fact, you were told that if you were shaking the olive tree and the fruit came to the ground, leave it. Leave that for those who are hungry and in need. Indeed, it went even farther. You were told not to harvest at harvest time all the way up to the edge of your property, but instead leave a swath of land that was unharvested so that if there was someone who was in need, someone was poor, someone was hungry, a widow, an orphan, they could come and eat and find their needs met. In a world that we live in, where so often we see signs that say, no trespassing, do not pick, do not touch, go away, beware of guard dog. If there'd been a sign there, it would have said, this is meant for you. How amazing is that? To live in a world that provided that way for God's people, but what truly is remarkable is that the provisions were not just for the Israelites. They were not just for God's people. They were meant for anyone. Very specifically, any sojourner, any traveler, any stranger who might be coming through, who needed, it was for them too. I, I imagine you're one of those people. Per perhaps you're a uh, Philistine. Perhaps you're a, a Canaanite or, whoo, worse yet, a Moabite. Moabites, oh, they know of Israel. They've tussled with Israel many times over the past. Their history goes all the way back to Abraham. They trace their lineage back to Lot, Abraham's cousin. They're well aware of these Israelites, and they have frequently not gotten along well. And they've learned something over the years, that if you try to stand up against the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you will fall every time. And they learned it the hard way. So you're a Moabite. And for some reason, you have to travel through Israel. Maybe you're kind of up north, and you have to get down south. I don't know why. Maybe you heard about a sick relative that you need to get down to. Maybe you're an emissary for another kingdom. Maybe there's a famine in your land. And you're just trying to get somewhere where you can live. I don't know what the reason was, but you're traveling through Israel. And as you make your way through Israel, you're very aware of the fact that you're other. And that these people and your people have not gotten along. And as the journey goes on and on and on, you find yourself getting hungrier and hungrier and wearier and wearier, and you need, but you know that you can't actually ask. But you've begun to notice something kind of strange. As you walk by farmstead after farmstead, you notice that these Israelite farmers are evidently not very good. <laughs> they leave stuff lying on the ground. And there's a swath of land that they just don't harvest. It's like they're stupid or something. And so you begin to think to yourself, I wonder, you know, I wonder, because I'm really hungry, is it still stealing? <laughs> if I go over and just kind of, boop. You've seen a few other people do it on your travels. They seem to be, you know, dumpster divers, the poorer of the poor. You don't want to be seen as one of them, but your need is growing. And so one day, you kind of look around, not seeing anybody sidle into the land and go and pick 
one piece, and then another because you're going to need one as you go along, until suddenly you hear a voice, and you shudder, because as you look, it's, it's the landowner coming with some of his workmen and coming to you, and he sees you with the food. And you're trying to figure out, how do I apologize for this? What do I say? But the landowner, a true Israelite, a true follower of the one true God, says, no, no, take as much as you need. This is meant for you. And you're blown away. You're shocked. You're overwhelmed. Really? This is for me? Yes, it's why it's here. And then, because you were lucky, and you met a true Israelite, one who is seeking to follow the Torah, one who actually wants to let their life be guided by the law. And that true Israelite says to you, I have a question. Where will you be resting tonight? Where will you be laying down your head? You should come to my house. You should come home with me. You will eat at my table. You can sleep in my household. And for as long as you need to be here in this region, be here in my household, and you will be as one of my household. We will treat you like family. You're not sure how you feel about that. Is this a trap? Is this a trick? But you're convinced, and so you come along, and you go, and you go to this household, and indeed, you find the blessings are everything promised and more. So much so that you let yourself be comfortable after your long, weary journey. You don't pick up and leave the next morning. You're going to stay and be refreshed for a few days. Regain your strength, and you find that the radical hospitality just seems to grow and grow and grow and overwhelm you and perplex you until your curiosity cannot be contained. And so finally you say to the host, why do you do this? Why do you do this for me, a Moabite? This true Israel, Israelite stops and, and looks at you. After a moment says, because you see, my God, the one true God, He called our people out of slavery, out of Egypt. He redeemed us. He saved us. He provides for us when we were nothing. And He made a covenant with us that He would always do this. And because he has done this, he asks us to do the same for others. And so I do this for you. And you marvel at this. You are amazed. Now, some of you are thinking, I've, I've read this story before. I've seen the clashes that can happen between the Moabites and the Israelites, between the Philistines and the Israelites, between the Canaanites and the Israelites. There are wars. Well, yes, there are. As nations, they don't get along, but as people look between and find these stories, they are scattered throughout that Old Testament, and a thing begins to happen again and again and again, and the marvelous thing is, is that person who is there decides they don't want to leave. They begin reflecting on their life in their homeland, and they think, hmm, it was nothing like this, and they make a decision. They say, I will stay, and your God will be my God, and your people will be my people, and I will live here by the mighty hand of God providing in these seemingly mundane ways, and I will provide for others too. And this is how the nation of Israel would flourish time and time again. Oh, I mean, it wasn't always happy parties. Who are we kidding? Things like death, war, disease, famine. They don't know nationality or creed. They come to us all. So in the midst of a system like this where a mighty God is providing generously, how in an everyday way could he possibly account for a tragedy, a great big tragedy of such a magnitude? How will his mighty hand be seen through his people in that case? No surprise, God had a plan for that too. He'd bake that into his laws. 
let's say for a moment there is a tragedy. Let's say there's a death in the family. Let's say, worse yet, in this time period, worse yet, it's the husband or father of the family. Oh, to be a woman at this time period is not a good thing. I'm not saying to be a woman in this time period in Israel is not a good thing. I'm saying it's not a really great thing anywhere on the planet. You don't get rights of inheritance. You're not allowed to go out and find your own way in life, and people often won't give it to you. So what are you to do? You're doomed. You're lost. You're going to fall through the cracks, but not in Israel. No, no, not in Israel. No, there's a plan for this. Because the larger family has an obligation to come alongside. And someone is called the kinsman redeemer. And the kinsman redeemer's job is to show up and stand in the place of the one who died and do what the one who died cannot do and care for those who are left. This might mean caring for the land so the the remaining family can eat from it and be provided for. This, in some cases, might even mean marrying the woman so that the family itself could be sheltered, cared for, protected, and provided. And as the kinsman redeemer, what did you get? Nothing. Nothing at all. Everything you did was credited to the man who was dead. Your righteous acts were credited to the dead man so that his family would go on, and his children and his children's children would not necessarily tell the story. They would not actually tell the story of the kinsman redeemer. They would tell the story of their father because that righteousness had been credited to them, and that land was theirs, and all the blessings went through them. The kinsman redeemer got nothing. They got all the work and not the blessing. The family of those who could do nothing for themselves got the blessing. This is not a story about Ruth. It is a story about God's provision. Oh, sure, Ruth's a character in the story. Absolutely. So is someone named Naomi and Boaz and all sorts of other people are going to float in and out. But it's not a story about her. She was a nobody. She was a Moabite immigrant woman, not worth paying attention to in the annals of history. And yet, she was important to the one who had created her, important enough to ensure that she and Naomi and all of them were provided for and cared for, so important that they were blessed and her children would then be blessed, and her children's children would then be blessed, and her children's children's children would then be blessed. Until one of those children's children's children, if I got enough children in there, would be a shepherd caring for sheep, playing his harp, singing songs, killing lions, when God would tap him to be the king of Israel. This shepherd named David would become the greatest king in the Old Testament, the king by which all other kings in the Old Testament are compared to. The one, a man after God's own heart. This was King David who would stand in the gap for the entire nation of Israel and provide for all of them as a redeemer. Yes, this no-count, no-named woman, Moabite, who got, named Ruth, who was just one of many that God provided for, was also the key to providing for the entire nation of Israel and generations to come. But of course, you know where this goes. Because a promise was made to David, wasn't it? A promise was made that another king would come in his line, a king greater even than he, a king that would not be a king of the nation of Israel, but a king who would be the king of all nations, not just all nations, but all of creation. And this king would not just redeem Israel. He would redeem all nations, all peoples, indeed all creation. And this king whom we call Messiah, whom we call Christ, whom we call Lord, he would redeem not with acts of war, 
not with money, not with taking over nations, but with his own precious blood. As all that you could not do because you were dead in your sin was placed upon him, and he, as the ultimate, final, and only needed kinsman redeemer, took upon himself all of that. And his righteousness was literally credited to you so that you could sit here now and be called a child of God, loved and saved through Jesus. And all of this, because God provided for a little no-named, no-account Moabite immigrant walking through Israel. This is not the story you expected. This is not the story of Ruth. It is a story of a God who loves his people, who cares for his people, who cherishes them, who redeems them and provides for them. This is a story about you. Amen.